September 2023, Close Encounter, Into the Light, Meet Suresh Ramaswamy, a tech entrepreneur and a spiritual teacher living in San Diego, California, whose transcendence journey and key messages revolve around light and infinity. Ashwin Patil interviews him. I met Suresh in a quaint little cafe in Bangalore on a rainy day in 2016. I distinctly remember how Suresh sat peacefully, sipping a hot cup of tea. His presence emanated a deep sense of bliss. Later, we became friends, and he coached me while I was going through an intense phase in my inner journey. I also attended a few of his online and in-person retreats in Bangalore. These retreats were spectacular because the focus was on directly experiencing the source and raising vibrations. After spending time with him, I felt convinced that Suresh had fully integrated and embodied the essence of consciousness. What is also interesting about Suresh's life is that he is a tech entrepreneur, a family man, and lives a regular life. He lives in San Diego, California, US, with his wife and kids. Suresh was born in Bangalore and grew up in Mumbai. He did his Bachelor of Engineering from Mumbai and his MS from the US. Suresh Ramaswamy is a transformational teacher and visionary entrepreneur passionate about igniting and catalyzing the transformation of humanity. He is the award-winning author of Just Be, Transform Your Life and Live as Infinity. You can find more about his work at https colon slash slash shurishramaswamy.org slash and his organization Radiant Field at https colon slash slash www.radiantfield.org. You grew up in Mumbai before traveling to the U.S. for higher studies. When did you get interested in spirituality? To know that is almost impossible. It began in my preschool days with very rich and spectacular dreams that were like science fiction movies. I would see patterns of light and colors which were vibrant and intelligent. I could interact with them. This stopped once school started because I got busy with the schedule. Later on, I did have interesting experiences from time to time. I remember coming back one day from school and going out to our backyard. It had just rained and everything smelled so good. But there was more than that. There was perfect clarity and bliss. It was very clear that this was fundamental and not another emotional experience. Of course, in a few days, it did go away. When I was 10 or 12, I started to enjoy reading science-related books, especially about galaxies, black holes, relativity theory, space, and time. This led me to read spiritual books in my teens. My family was not immersed in spirituality. It was an average Indian household. My parents would do the morning puja every day. We would go to a temple and, sometimes, for Bhagavad Gita talks or to ashrams. I would enjoy these occasions very much. How did the culture of Mumbai shape your spiritual pursuit? Mumbai has got a very dynamic quality. It's full of energy and vibrancy, and contains a wide spectrum of food, cultures, and religions. People here are go-getters, whether it is business or spirituality. I think, somewhere, that was a part of me. I couldn't just sit back and think everything was going to come to me. I knew I had to put in the effort and be enterprising. I had to be creative and think originally. It is important not just for outer success but for inner success too. I am grateful to have grown up in Mumbai. That's amazing. The outer hustle shaped your inner hustle. What was your spiritual pursuit like? Very unremarkable. It was amazing to read and hear about the experiences of Swami Vivekananda or Paramahansa Yogananda. Suresh Rama Swami, one with the light. Their stories would actually shift my energy and consciousness, and I could feel the change. However, everyone said I couldn't just read books, I had to practice. So I would meditate for 10 minutes, but the mind would get very chatty. I assumed your mind had to be quiet, so I felt unsuccessful at meditation. But on the other hand, I would just see light inside. I would close my eyes and look into the inner sky and the inner sun. I never thought that this was significant. So this state lasted for many decades. Did you meet or follow any living teacher? Along the way, I've met several teachers. None of them felt as if they were my teacher. 
One particular sage pointed out my connection with light that I've had throughout, even my being is named after the sun. My name is one of the words for the sun. Looking back, I would say, light itself and infinity are my teachers. Not just in this life but several lifetimes. When did you realize that light and infinity were speaking to you and through you? After about 25 years of practicing, my meditation started to intensify. I would do six-hour meditations regularly. Out of the six hours, most of the time, I was just sitting there. But there would be half a minute when something undeniable happened. At first, the light and I were together but not for too long. You cannot last in that light. So you disappear and there is only that light. When I entered meditation, I would have some worldly thoughts, such as having to deal with an issue or even asking God why he did a particular thing to me. But you can't do anything when you meet God. So it was incredibly uplifting. The experience of disappearing was like being struck by lightning. It would change my vibration. I was not the same old person thinking the same old thoughts. Earlier, I would feel I would have to take another birth for self-realization because I was still alive. But now I know that in the act of surrender, you're actually going to die for the first and last time. That part of you which holds itself apart from infinite life is going to relinquish itself into infinity. This does not happen instantly. There is an unknown period of time before it kicks in. You don't control it. And when it happens, you know grace has essentially embraced you. Even so, everything goes on as usual. After your self-realization, what inspired you to become a teacher? There were a few turning points and events which led to my teaching a course on personal transformation at the local community college, here in California. Another significant event was my writing of the book just be several years ago. I would have these promptings to write a book. And I turned them down. I felt that even if I came up with the most incredible content, there was already such good content available. We didn't need another book. The inklings intensified, as if somebody was knocking on my door. I responded that unless the book inherently had a vibration that could uplift the readers, I would not write the book. It was made very clear to me that I didn't have to worry about that. I was shown, rather than told, that the book would have a vibration. I was in tears because this was not me. This was something bigger saying, we're going to take care of the real stuff. You just do your little part. So I could no longer argue. That realization led to the book, which was the first big step in becoming a public figure. I realized that people picking up the book would have never met me or heard of me. Another turning point was when I started doing events like retreats and workshops. My preference would have been to stay private and obscure. However, Light made it very clear that it wanted me to be playing the role of a public teacher. And that also empowered me because Light made it clear that it was actually doing it, not me. So what is your message or, rather, Light's message? One of the things I would start out by saying is to go directly to the source. I like to use the term infinity to refer to all that is, everything, the ultimate. Only the infinity can pull it off. So I would say go straight for that. Don't depend on any intermediary, including me. It's important for each one of us to know that and not feel excessively dependent on anything outside of ourselves. In terms of what I talk about, I use perhaps three words, being, light, and infinity. I already talked about infinity. What is being? Being is actually the very core of what we are. So if you start stripping away the layers, you might start with possessions, then. When I entered meditation, I would have some worldly thoughts, such as having to deal with an issue or even asking God why he did a particular thing to me. But you can't do anything when you meet God. So it was incredibly uplifting. The experience of disappearing was like being struck by lightning. It would change my vibration. I was not the same old person thinking the same old thoughts. Now let me talk about light. If you look at creation, we have planets and galaxies, but even beyond galaxies, we have many dimensions. Beyond the physical reality, there is the non-physical reality. So, this everything together is creation. And if you were to say, what is all this made of? It's all vibrations. 
Now if you keep looking at the vibration and you focus on the most refined of vibrations, that's what I call light. This is transcendental light as opposed to ordinary light. Why is this important? When we start trying to find our way back to our true nature, the nature of reality in the physical plane is very confusing. We can call upon the transcendental light and connect with it. Light is able to lift us out of the confusion very quickly because it is the most refined vibration and we are attuning to it. This helps us in raising our vibration and anchors us in beingness from where we are connected to the source itself, which is infinity. So, if you keep these three in mind, you're in good shape. Suresh, if this was so easy, many people would be self-realized by now. What comes in their way? The reason why it's so hard to find the truth, and truth with the capital T, is because people don't really want it. Even if we have a spiritual interest, it is half-hearted. It's like a hobby. You got to really want it. Your yearning has to be so strong that it is singular. If somebody could put a probe into your heart, there is only one melody coming, the one music, your heart singing for the infinite. So, for someone who is reading this article and wanting to merge with the source or get realized, what is your message? Firstly, the title of my book is the summary of what I have to say, just be. So, just be is the primary directive from the beginning to the end. Now, a lot of people will say, I need some more understanding and known practices. For this reason, the book is there. A core practice that I talk about is something called Awakening Infinite Radiance, AIR, which will help you systematically move towards beingness. It takes you from a more finite orientation to the infinite. This is the foundational practice. You can learn it from the book. I also describe a framework which is important to understand. Transcend, integrate, and embody, these are the three phases of growth. The reason why it's so hard to find the truth, and truth with the capital T, is because people don't really want it. Even if we have a spiritual interest, it is half-hearted. It's like a hobby. You got to really want it. Your yearning has to be so strong that it is singular. If somebody could put a probe into your heart, there is only one melody coming, the one music, your heart singing for the infinite. Could you please talk about these three phases? If you don't develop holistically and in a balanced way, at some point, you will find that some areas are highly undeveloped, and this can hold you back. Transcendence happens when we lift our consciousness and touch something super high. However, other parts of us may have remained the same. And these will show up when we function in the world. Integration comes next when I work on bringing that light to other areas in my life which are still in the shadows. It is generally not as much fun. Whereas transcendence is really blissful. If somebody tells you, you cleaned up one room in your house but that other room you didn't, you then feel compelled to clean the other room too. It may be hard work, but it's important to bring light to all the areas. Then comes the embodiment phase where you radiate light, sharing it with the world. This is very important because you are never in isolation. You're always part of the whole. You are not this one little guy who went off and became enlightened. You include the world because you are connected with the whole world. So, those are the three phases from light's perspective. Are these phases linear or nonlinear? It's actually both, which may seem very strange. So, there is a macro transcend phase where people are involved in blissful experiences, like going to an ashram, tasting bliss in meditations, or satori. This could be followed by a macro integration phase, where this bliss which was experienced is integrated with our shadows, and then our behavior in the outer world radiates the peace and love which is the embodiment of light. However, within the transcend phase, you can have many cycles where there's a transcend integration phase and that little thing you can integrate and then embody. So you can have these many cycles also. In a single day, let's say you had a deep meditation in the morning. That is mostly transcendence. Then, of course, you had to take care of some work which required you to drive somewhere, integration is happening. In your work and in your relationships, a lot of integration is happening. When this evolution is happening, how does one balance spiritual and material pursuits? Let me share from my own life. After my studies, I started working with larger corporations. After some time, 
I realize that while corporate jobs offer predictable income, security, and in my case, even a good boss and co-workers, there was no place for internal freedom and creativity. So I decided to start a tech startup in my garage. The entrepreneurial journey involves risk-taking big time. There is also a high degree of uncertainty. You don't know what even next week is going to bring. So that raises a lot of fears. All those years of meditation brought me face to face with my fears, and I worked on that for several years. I think business helped me in spirituality and vice versa. That was a significant phase of my growth. We don't have to look at money and physical things as being anti-spiritual. That's a very limited way of looking at it. If I do meditation, I am spiritual. But five days a week, in corporate meetings, doing presentations is just business and material corporate life. It doesn't make sense. Your own being is continuously present 24 hours a day. Okay, you may present yourself a little differently, but your awareness is the key. That's there all the time. So when you step into a corporate environment or whatever your work looks like, don't switch off until you go home to meditate. That situation contains big spiritual growth. So everything is spiritual if you ask me. Spirituality is happening all the time. My last question to you, Suresh, are we humans stepping up to our spiritual dimension? I would say we are stepping up but tentatively, incrementally. I think we can do better. It doesn't have to be all 8 billion people. There are enough of us who are willing to really step up that will make a big difference. So I am optimistic. The second reason I am optimistic is the light itself. Light is intensifying on the planet. It is really very strong. I see that as simply a blessing from light. Which means each and every one of us who decides to step up will get a boost from light, and we will feel it as we go deeper and deeper. You'll be able to take in a lot more light, and you will find it supporting you to do whatever you need to do next. And it is such a tremendously positive thing that growth can become so good. When you step into that resonance and attunement with light, it's beautiful, and because of this, I think more and more people will realize their true nature. It may happen in their own way, they may not even use the word light. It doesn't matter. They will feel inside and they will step up. And so, that makes me feel very optimistic. Ashwin Patil is an executive coach for startup and social impact leaders. He loves integrating and embodying peace through daily living, work and writing. He lives in Bangalore, 